Great. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much. I'm Sarah Parmar, and I'm uh, joining from the Denver area in Colorado. Um, and I kind of get to wear two hats. I first became connected with Kivira um, and attended my first Kivira conference um, at a much younger age. Um, I grew up in a ranching family in Arizona. And so uh, first learned about Kivira through that personal connection um, as, as part of a ranching family. Um, and I now work as director of conservation for Colorado Open Lands, which is a statewide land trust here in Colorado. Um, so I'm looking forward to talking with you all today. Um, Ed and I are going to each talk a little bit about how our respective land trusts are really kind of pivoting to focus a lot more on the land part of land and water conservation. Um, and so we'll each share a little bit and um, welcome questions at the end. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully this works. There we go. Great. Um, so uh, again, my organization is Colorado Open Lands. We are a statewide land trust and we hold um, over half a million acres under conservation easement across the state of Colorado. So we work in most of the different river basins um, around the state. And first, I just want to give a little bit of context for land conservation work and land trust work um, and say that you know, conservation easements have focused largely on land use. Uh, but for a long time, the community has recognized that the things that we value, the conservation values or the public benefits that come from these lands are very much connected to water rights and that water rights support many of these values. And so the way that most land trusts, at least here in Colorado, have recognized that connection um, is by writing into a conservation easement that the water rights associated with that land that have been used on that land must continue to be used as they have been. So if uh, someone has been irrigating this beautiful farm in this picture, um, they must continue to irrigate that farm and they cannot change the use of that water without um, our permission and without an analysis of how that impacts the conservation values for which uh, the conservation easement was created. Um, just a little bit more background for those who may not be as familiar with conservation easements as, as a tool. Um, a conservation easement is essentially a legal agreement. Um, and it's a, a piece of paper, um, an increasingly thick set of papers, um, which is a voluntary agreement between a private landowner and an organization like a land trust that restricts or prohibits certain uses of that property and or its water rights in order to protect those conservation values. Um, and it has to, uh, most of the benefits associated with conservation easements um, flow originally from the IRS. So a lot of the language that the land trust community uses and that conservation easements are framed around are um, this idea of, of um, these conservation values that have been outlined by the IRS. Um, the way that conservation easements are valued financially um, is essentially kind of a double appraisal. So someone looks at, you know, what is the, the highest and best use um, of, of property? Um, if someone is going to put it on the market tomorrow, uh, who would buy it and what would they use it for? Um, what's financially and physically and feasibly um, the, the highest market value for that property? And then how has a conservation easement restricted or changed that marketability of a property? So a lot of the times land and water is just valued together. Um, so, so an appraiser might say, you know, if the land, if the water has to um, continue to be used for irrigation, 
what would an irrigated property be valued at versus a dry land property. But increasingly, um, we exist in a world where there is a market for water rights, where water rights are separately sold or are sort of the focus of a purchase. And so in these cases, an appraiser may be able to look at how does the conservation easement um, impact the saleability of water rights um, as kind of a standalone financial value. So again, we've sort of treated we've sort of treated conservation easements as this parcel by parcel transaction um, within our state. But I think that um, in Colorado and really across the West, we're looking at kind of this key moment in time in terms of our water um, in particular, where you know there's there's a number of factors and they they um, have different weights in different places, but climate change, population pressure, um, different social values on water use, um, demands for things like water for recreation. These are all putting pressure on our water rights and really um, putting pressure on each drop of water to do more and to meet multiple kinds of uses. And so I think each of our land trusts, Ed's and mine, have looked at um, these pressures and said, you know, what, what is our role as a land trust? So I'm going to show you kind of the numerical challenge here in Colorado, but recognize that this is much better uh, or much bigger than any um, particular state. Um, but here in Colorado, we have a statewide water plan, which looked at a water gap um, in the coming decade. And if nothing changes, um, if the status quo continues, we look at losing approximately 20% of our irrigated land across the state um, and differing amounts in different river basins. So these are each of the river basins um, in Colorado. We are a headwater state, of course, so we have a lot of different rivers, um, but almost all of those stand to lose um, if we continue the status quo. So uh, we're, we're absolutely looking at permanent reduction um, of acreage if something doesn't change. And those pressures kind of come from largely two different places. One of them is the conversion of agricultural water to urban use, um, municipal and industrial water demand. Um, so this is the practice of buy and dry, where cities um, or businesses acquire their water rights by purchasing irrigated farmland and permanently drying up that farmland in order to use those water rights um, somewhere else. The second challenge is groundwater sustainability. So as um, as our farming techniques, as our irrigation technology has gotten better and better, uh, we're, we're drawing out more than is going back in. Um, so I will talk um, a little bit about the Rio Grande Basin, which is in the south central part of Colorado. Um, and Ed will focus a little bit more on the buy and dry. But uh, first, I wanted to just talk about COL's approach briefly that we're using in the South Platte Basin, which is where um, the major, the majority of Colorado's population is right now. So it's where Denver, Fort Collins, Greeley, some of our fastest growing counties or cities are in um, the South Platte Basin. Um, and so, and it's also where Colorado's, most of Colorado's prime soils are located and our biggest, um, our biggest agriculturally producing counties. Um, so in those places, there's extreme pressure on these water rights to be sold for municipal use. Um, and so we, as a land trust, have kind of asked, well, what happens if instead of requiring that water rights stay with the land and never be used for anything other than their historic use, um, what happens if we add some flexibility into our conservation easement language? And what happens if we actually look at working together with cities um, to encourage them to lease water rather than buying and drying? So what if we put together conservation easements and 
water lease agreements so that there's certainty on for all parties, there's certainty for the city that if they lease the water, somebody isn't gonna buy that out from under them because the conservation easement says it can never be sold, but it can be leased. And so the farmer is also able to diversify their income um, while providing certainty overall for that ditch system. And we also can look then at, at leveraging different resources um, for those producers to help them look at transitioning and to help um, those cities think about sort of doing business differently. And I think that um, land trusts are an important player because we help build protections in um, for those resources, for that soil itself um, to ensure continued productivity. So just as one example, um, we started working with a farmer um, in this basin um, about an hour and a half northeast of the city of Denver. And he let us know that um, a city had purchased a neighbor's farm immediately adjacent to his. Um, so this is a city that's 200 miles away that's purchased the additional farm for buy and dry. And so we said to the city, you know, we're going to be working on a conservation easement with this farmer. Would you be interested in leasing this person's water? Um, you're going to be changing some of this water right anyway as you dry up this neighboring property. But would you think about leasing this water rather than going out and buying another farm um, to add water to your portfolio? And by doing that, we also were able to bring multiple funders to the table. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Ducks Unlimited were interested in the flyaway region that this property was located in. And RCS was interested in the prime soils and the Walton Family Foundation and the Colorado Water Conservation Board were interested in this leasing potential in this idea of leasing to avoid further buy and dry and to protect um, to keep water rights intact and in place most of the time as well. And so we were able to not only bring money from these different sources for the conservation easement itself, but also bring money to help the farmer look at, you know, what is your financial feasibility if you are, um, if you're gonna be leasing some of this water, say three years in 10, um, what's the best option for you in terms of um, what you do with those with your property on, um, you know, are you going to follow one circle in a given year? Are you going to switch crops? Are you going to um, just water less in given years? Um, and what is the best financially for you? And what is the best in terms of um, keeping that, that viability and actually looking at building in some resilience in terms of reduced tillage and cover cropping um, to make this this property kind of more sustainable and more resilient in the long term. Um, so that that's kind of one tool that we've used. Um, and then going back to the groundwater sustainability driver uh, in terms of water scarcity, um, I want to take you to the San Luis Valley, which is in again the south central part of the state. Um, it's a it's an amazing area, um, you know, rich agricultural. Uh, economy and a lot of heritage, um, a lot of amazing wildlife, um, great sand dunes national park. Um, all of these things are very water dependent. So it's um, a high mountain valley, um, 11,000 uh, feet in elevation, uh, bounded by two significant mountain ranges, the Sangre de Cristos to the east and the San Juans to the west. Um, and underlying this rich system, um, which in, out of which the Rio Grande River flows, um, are two different aquifers. So there's a, an unconfined aquifer, which is a very shallow, um, kind of um, ephemeral, difficult to, different, difficult to model and map layer. Um, and then underlying that is a confining layer of clay. And then below that is a confined aquifer. And um, the history of the San Luis Valley 
um, is that there, it has the, the very oldest water rights in the state of Colorado. We have hand dug acequias in the southern part of the valley. And then um, what you see in these colored areas um, are high concentrations of high capacity irrigation wells. So um, people started coming and settling in the San Luis Valley um, and relying significantly on groundwater. And then of course, as, as pumping got better and better, um, and as climate conditions have changed and not as much water is flowing back into the aquifer, um, they, the state um, and, and I would say everyone living in this valley has realized that they are in an unsustainable situation. Um, specifically, um, the state's models have shown um, and I don't expect anyone to, uh, to actually read these numbers, but I'll kind of walk you through this graph. Um, on the bottom, you have, you have time. And um, on, the, on the left axis, um, on the y-axis, you have uh, change in storage, in water storage, in aquifer level, essentially. Um, and this is just one of the aquifers, the unconfined aquifer. But you can see that trend line um, is bad you can see that as of last year, 2020, um, it is significantly below um, the red line, which is the line of sustainability as determined by the, the state engineer's office. So this community um, is in serious trouble and has spent the last, essentially since 2002, um, trying to figure out how to increase storage in their aquifer. Um, this community has come together in, in really significant ways um, through the creation of each of these colored areas. Um, each, each colored area represents a groundwater subdistrict. So people kind of formed these groups to, to see whether within each of these groups um, they could formulate local solutions to reduce pumping. Uh, the largest area in red, um, just north of the Rio Grande River, is the first subdistrict, and they began essentially taxing themselves. Um, they set a pumping fee rate um, to try to generate a pot of money uh, to pay people who were willing to, um, to, to stop farming, stop irrigating, um, and coupled that with the federal CREP program, that's the um, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, which is essentially a, a pay to follow program. Um, and they had some success uh, early on, but um, the, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, the people who were interested in, um, in following have done so, and they've not yet come close enough to their, to their goal of recovery. So um, we started Colorado Open Lands and a local land trust, the Rio Grande Headwaters Land Trust, started meeting with irrigators in 2019. And we held meetings across each of the groundwater subdistricts and said, you know, what would a program look like to you um, that you'd be willing to participate in to reduce your, your pumping? And what we kept hearing from um, these irrigators was flexibility. You know, we are farming because we like to farm. Um, we don't necessarily want to completely follow our fields and, uh, you know, turn off our tractors for good. We'd like to um, continue farming at some level. Um, and on the other hand, what we heard from the people who were managing these subdistricts, these water conservation districts, uh, was, you know, we need some kind of permanence. We are spending lots of money on very temporary solutions that sort of get us um, to meet each year's goals, but not any further ahead. Um, and we, we all recognize that something's got to give and we need something that we and this whole community can plan on um, so that we can all have a future uh, for this valley. So, um, when we heard permanence plus flexibility, we thought that 
you know, maybe we can reimagine our conservation easements, which again have usually been focused on land use restrictions. Um, maybe we can use this same tool in a new way to help meet um, these, these aquifer needs. So um, we worked together with the water managers, with the local land trust, um, with attorneys and, and water attorneys to kind of create a new tool or reimagine an existing tool, I should say, um, which we're calling a groundwater conservation easement. So this is really more focused on limiting groundwater pumping. Um, and the, I think the beauty of this is that it is tailored to a specific property. So an irrigator could come to us and say, you know, I think that I can reduce my irrigation by 30%. Um, I can reduce my pumping, I should say, by 30%. And they can figure out the best way to do that on their particular operation. Um, but we can also bring technical assistance funding to help them figure out that transition. And then we actually build that restriction into the conservation easement. And when the conservation easement is valued, we can actually look at how that restriction and pumping changes the future profitability of that farm and compensate that landowner for that difference that they're giving up by restricting their pumping. Um, so we are working in, in partnership with the Rio Grande Water Conservation District, which sort of manages all of those sub-districts um, to develop kind of a joint conservation program to ensure that water that is not being used, it's actually legally left in the aquifer as storage water. Um, and that it can't be abandoned under Colorado water law, but it's, it's really truly kept in the aquifer as savings. Um, and there, they would also be a partner in enforcing a conservation easement with us um, and recognizing that, um, that the goal is to help irrigators transition and help them uh, meet this pumping restriction. It also uses kind of tried and true conservation easement funding sources. So uh, we were just awarded um, within the last year a, a regional conservation partnership program grant from NRCS. So that's $6.7 million that we get to use for this concept within uh, the San Luis Valley. And then that's being leveraged by a million and a half dollars from the Colorado Water Conservation Board to try to actually put these into action. Um, we're currently working with a landowner to, um, to actually fully follow a, a portion of his circles. Um, and then afterwards, the Rio Grande Water Conservation District would purchase that land um, and work on the revegetation with um, an ultimate resale um, to an ag producer for, for pasture land, essentially for grazing. Um, but kind of putting these different pieces and partners um, and funding together to help, um, to help put this into action is really exciting and, um, and inspiring. And we don't know if it's gonna work yet, um, we're still in the exploratory phase of, of a few different projects, but um, I think that this, this first landowner that we're working with, um, he told us that his motivation is that, um, you know, he and his wife don't have children. And he said, you know, I understand the challenge that we're in as a community. I understand that we're using more water than we have. He said, my wife and I don't have children. And when I look around at my neighbors and my community, you know, they're all trying to pass this on to the next generation. And so if anybody in this community can afford to try something like this, it's, it's my wife and I, and we're willing to try to be a part of this solution. And it's really inspiring to try to bring resources to people um, with that type of community mindset who are looking for solutions. Um, so I will end my part of that there and turn it over to Ed, who will talk a little bit more about his, uh, his land trust work. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
and I'm I'm with Palmer Land Conservancy. My name is Ed Robertson, the conservation director, and we actually uh, gave Colorado Open Lands an award a few years ago, one of our um, Southern Colorado Conservation Awards, and we made a great film about some of the work that Sarah's working on. And when I'm done with my presentation, I will uh, put that in the chat because it, I think it really highlights the the community basis of everything she's doing, and um, really shows the the scenery of the San Luis Valley for those of you who've never been there. Let me um, share my screen real quick. All right, everybody see that okay? Um, great, well again, yeah, my name's Ed Robertson. I'm conservation director at Palmer Land Conservancy. Up until a few years ago, we were Palmer Land Trust, but we did a, a rebrand and, and changed our name a little bit. And I think that that new name change reflects some of the innovative work that we're, we're doing around the, around the state and um, work that's being, you know, has the potential to be replicated throughout the West. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific project um, that I'm in charge of here at Palmer called the Bessemer Farmland Conservation Project. Palmer Land Conservancy, um, we've been around since 1977. We've conserved right around 140,000 acres of land, and we operate uh, pretty much in the southeastern quadrant of, of Colorado. A lot of our work is in the um, Arkansas River Basin. We do a little bit in the South Platte. But um, we are, are focused on land and water conservation. We do some um, open space, uh, public open space. We do, you know, typical um, conserving scenic views, and then we do a lot with um, farms and ranches. And so this particular project um, is in Pueblo County, which is just south of Colorado Springs, where I'm located. So if you can see my my cursor here. Um, Colorado Springs, this is where I'm located. You go down the I-25 about um, about 40 minutes to the city of Pueblo. And you can see here, this is really lays out how the, the Arkansas River comes in, starts at the base of Mount El Elbert, comes in, this is Pueblo Reservoir, and then it goes out. And this whole area through here is some of the more productive irrigated farmland um, in the West. And this particular map shows obviously Pueblo County here, but it also shows the other regions farther out to the east. And I've, I've found and given this presentation, the best way to kind of demonstrate the, the challenge facing Pueblo County is to talk about another county, Crowley County. And so this map shows, uh, the green shows areas that are still irrigated and the yellow shows areas that were formally irrigated. So when you're, um, when you're looking at this map, you can see Pueblo County still has the vast majority of its irrigated farmland is still in production. But when you look at Crowley County, you can see that the vast majority, uh, over 90%, has been dried up. And so back in, in the 70s and 80s in Crowley County, as you know, uh, municipal expansion was ha happening all along the front range of Colorado, uh, municipalities like Colorado Springs, Aurora, just different, different cities came to the farmers of Crowley County and said, we need to buy, we'd like to buy your water, will you sell? And they started selling. And which, you know, you can't blame them. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with that. They needed to do what was right for their, for their family and for their operations. And they were paid, uh, in some cases, a premium for that water. And so they, they sold the water. And then over the course of those two decades, all this farmland started being dried up. And there was really no, um, no real thought put to the future, uh, no plan put in place, no, no um, way thinking, thinking about, well, what's this going to look like in the year 2020? And I'll put a link in the, in the chat to this when we're done here, when I'm done talking. But this is one of the best articles I've ever read about municipal buy and dry. And it's in that magazine called 5280. And um, it's specifically about Crowley County and exactly what happened. But basically, you know, when there is buy and dry, the cities take water off of agricultural lands and move it um, into cities. And in the, you know, in, in, in the wake is left dried up farmland. And so one of the, there are a lot of issues with that. One of the issues that always needs to be, that needs to be handled that we've learned from places like Crowley County is that the, um, it needs to be properly revegetated. And the, it was not properly revegetated. And so I think there used to be around 50,000 acres of uh, irrigated farmland. 
in Crowley County, if my number, if my memory serves correctly, and now there's about 4,500 left. And so a lot of that was not revegetated. And so this is actually a picture that was taken out in that area. And I always say, if you were to put this thing in black and white, you could convince somebody that this was the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And so there, there's just a lot of weeds out there, a lot of bare ground, and there are these dust storms. I mean, I, I used to be on the board of Palmer before I joined as a staff member, and I've spent some time out there riding around with our um, one of my colleagues, Matt Heimrich, who was actually a farmer in Crowley County on one of the few remaining farms. And, and you see um, what can happen from just an ecological perspective when these grass, when these form, these irrigated farms are not put back into grass properly. And so, you know, from an ecological standpoint, not great. Um, from an economic standpoint, you know, uh, Crowley County used to be one of the, this vibrant agricultural community. You know, agriculture was the backbone of the economy, the families there, the community was all based around agriculture. And as they started drying up that farmland, you know, year after year, a little bit after a little bit, um, you, you fast forward to these, these stats are from 2011, and we need to get updated stats. I'd be interested to see what they are now. And you can see Crowley County is not only one of the poorest counties in Colorado, but it's one of the poorest counties in the United States. Um, and so, you know, what used to be an economy driven by agriculture, the now the biggest contributor to the tax base are, are prisons, one of which is a for-profit prison. And so it's it's just not, you know, obviously not great from a from a um, economic perspective. And so and then, you know, there's the there's the community erosion that takes place from that as the farming dried up, as the ecology uh, was was, you know, put in a, in a not so great place. Obviously, the, the ripple effects go beyond, you know, any of that. And so, you know, as unfortunate as that is, there's still a lot of farmers there, Matt and Heimer, my colleague included, who are, who are making a go of it and having successful operations, but they're doing so um, with a lot of challenges in place. And so when you look to Pueblo County, really, you look throughout the whole um, lower Arkansas Valley, you see Pueblo County, there's still this opportunity to ensure that the vast majority of um, farmland is kept in production, or if it is dried up, it, it's done so with a plan. And so that, that brings me to our project, the Bessemer Farmland Project. So kind of the, the background on that, on this project is that in uh, 2009, the local, um, the local utility, Pueblo Water, it was formerly known as Pueblo Board of Water Works, came to all, uh, all the farmers throughout the, um, you know, throughout the, the, the region. And so this is Pueblo. And then there are these three different, St. Charles Mesa, Vineland, and Avondale, kind of the three small communities that, that make up this farming area. And as for some context, you can see the blue here is the Arkansas River. The black is the Bessemer Ditch, which takes water out of Pueblo Reservoir and irrigates all of this farmland. All told, it's about 20,000 acres of farmland. And so, you know, as you all well know, um, at the Kavira Conference, th this would all be grassland and it would not be growing vegetables and pumpkins and that kind of thing without irrigation. And so, you know, the, the water really is the lifeblood of the economy when it comes to farming here in this region. And, the, you know, it's worth noting there, there are some commodity crops being grown here. There's some corn and things like that. But a, a lot of what is grown here are fruits and vegetables. The, the, the famed Pueblo chili, and I might get in trouble on a New Mexico call for talking about how great the Pueblo chili is. Sarah Wenzel Fisher was on stage with me when I said that in, in Santa Fe, I got booed. Um, but I'll, I'll contend that, that the Pueblo of Chile is superior. Um, the Pueblo of Chile is grown here. Um, there's a lot of pumpkins grown here, a lot of um, melons, uh, a lot of things, that, you know, crops that you can take straight out of the, out of the uh, field and put on the table. And so there are a lot of high value crops and it's all made possible by this water. So back to the, the water um, purchase in, in 2009, Pueblo Board of Water Works approached the farmers and, and offered to buy the water rights. And so you can see here, every one of these parcels here that I have outlined in uh, red, sold their water to Pueblo Water in 2009. Pueblo Water immediately leased the water back through 2029. So there's never been a, a break in the, um, in the agricultural production. If you go down there and drive around right now and you know, we're finishing up harvest season, you wouldn't know anything happened because 
all these farms are still in production. They're still leasing their water back from Puebla. Um, the issue is that in 2029, or they've started extending the leases a little bit, possibly in 2039, some of these farms are going to start being dried up. And so, you know, given the population projections that you see for Colorado, it's really not a question of if this water is going to be taken and moved, either used for, for Pueblo or, or, you know, sold to other municipalities. It's really not a question of if, it's a question of when that's going to happen. And so whether it's 2029, 2039, 2079, there is gonna be a dry up of this area. And this, all these uh, parcels make up about a third of the productive farmland. So it would be significant, it will be significant when it happens. Um, and so the other issue um, about that is that we, we've done some landscape scale analysis of, of the area and of the farmland. And this, uh, this map here shows the, the relative productivity of all the different parcels here. And the ones that are outlined in black are the ones that sold their water. And it's worth noting that all this farmland is exceptional. You know, the soil quality, the, the, the climate of this particular area, the quality of the water that comes out of Vesmer Ditch. I always say like trying to rank this farmland is like if you're trying to rank the NBA All-Star team, they're all really, really good. But if you had to put them in order, you could. And so using... As part of our research, we, we hired some GIS experts out of, uh, out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, who did a lot of work. The, the, the biggest factor in determining the productivity of this farmland is NRCS soil maps, but there's also you know, how, how close the, the farms are to other farms, the, the topography, the, the slope, a lot of different factors go in. And, and the bottom line is the darkest green or the most productive um, down to some of these pieces here that are like along these creeks that are red, which are the least productive, but again, all very productive farmland. And so you can see here that the, the, the vast majority of the parcels that sold their water to Pueblo are also the most productive. So you think about fast forward and when this gets dried up from an economic standpoint, these most productive pieces would be the ones that would get dried up. And so the, the impact from an economic perspective is likely going to be more than a third, even though this makes up a third of the total land. When you're looking at output, agricultural output, these make up for more than a third of that. And so, you know, one thing that's worth noting is when I started first on the board at Palmer and then as conservation director, at my, my first thought was that, oh, well, Pueblo Water came in and bought this water and that's not great. But what I realized pretty quickly just through my own research and then through talking with the locals in, in Pueblo, which is the key to the success of this whole project, is that Pueblo water is, a, is, a, is seen as a hero to the, the community of Pueblo because what they did was they raised tens of millions of dollars and figured out a way to purchase this water and then lease it back to the farmers and really protect the water future of Pueblo. And so, you know, if they had not have purchased this, odds are a different municipality, whether it's Aurora, Colorado Springs, or some other municipality would have come in and purchased it and may, maybe would not have leased it back. And it would be completely out of their, out of their uh, control. And so Pueblo Water has a real, you know, obviously a love of the community and an interest in seeing the community be um, strong for generations to come. So it, it really is best case scenario when you think about what could have happened at Pueblo Water was able to purchase this. And Pueblo Water has been a great partner to ours throughout this whole process that I'm gonna tell you more about. Um, so what we've got here is a choice of how we can move forward. When you look at Crowley County and what happened out there, all those water purchases were driven by outsiders and it was one-sided. It was whoever bought the water wins, they're able to take it you know, to wherever they, wherever they wanna take it and, you know, grow their real estate development or grow their tax base or whatever. And they leave Pueblo County literally in the dust, like completely dried up. Pueblo, uh, Crowley County loses whoever took the water, whoever bought the water, fair and square, but whoever bought it, they win. It was obviously, as I showed you in that picture, is, has environmental, um, it's detrimental from an environmental perspective, economically destructive. And, and because of those two things together is socially destructive. Again, there's still some farmers there making a go of it, but it's, it's nothing like it was in the 50s. And so in Pueblo County, we've been presented with this great opportunity, you know, in this post-acquisition landscape. A lot, of, a lot of work that land trusts do are trying to get ahead of, of, of water purchases, you know, putting easements, locking water to the land, 
and what's so interesting about this is the acquisition already happened. And if nothing is done, we can, it's gonna be a problem either two or three or even four decades from now. But we're presented with this opportunity to really come up with a better way forward and a more effective way forward where really everybody can win. And so we've got this community driven project with a win, win, win solution. You know, the, the farmers can win, the city of Pueblo can win, conservation organizations like mine can win, and then all the different industries that um, depend on agriculture, they can also win. And so it conserves land and water, which is what I'm in the business of doing and ensures local food production, which all of a sudden people are a lot more interested in since COVID. You, know, you think back to April, 2020, when the, the shelves were bare in, in grocery stores and that even somebody in downtown Denver who's never considered where their food comes from. They, they, they all of a sudden got it. Bolsters the local economy and it protects the, the agricultural heritage of Pueblo, which has been you know, very important since, since the, 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 the town was founded. And so how Palmer came into this, this project um, is the, the way that we kind of helped to guide, guide this project, uh, which was based on community input was, and I can, I can talk about it for hours if you wanted, but I'll just cut to the chase, is that when Pueblo Water, so Pueblo Water bought the water, then they, they took it through water court to get it changed from agricultural use to municipal use. And we partnered up with Pueblo Water and we got a provision included in that water court change case. And it, the technical term is the substitution of dry up provision. But basically it's a few paragraphs that were very, 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 very expensive paragraphs. They got put into that final uh, water rights decree. And what it allows us to do is to move water from less productive parcels that still own the water onto more productive parcels that sold the water. So for example, you can see this red piece here, according to, the, to our high level analysis, and everything has to be ground truth obviously, but high level analysis, this, is a, this red piece here that I'm pointing to has, is less productive. Um, and this, for example, this green piece here is more productive, but it sold its water. So if nothing had been done at some point, this piece here would be dried up. What this uh, provision allows us to do is move the water from this red piece onto the green piece. And then when it comes time to dry it up, we dry up the red piece. And so there's obviously uh, lots of benefits to doing that. You know, we, we keep the most productive land in, in production, which helps on a lot of different levels. When you start looking, we've done some research, and when you start looking at parcels like these red parcels here along the, along the creek or these, there are actually some water quality benefits from that as well. So say you were to dry these up and keep these in production, having these, these parcels here dry, it almost acts as a, almost like a filter. And there are, there are ways, you know, as, as the water runs out, it runs off in the ditch and off the fields, it actually filters the water a bit. So it's, it, it improves water quality. Which is uh, which is of interest, and that's a that's a long way out. You know, when when these places start being dried up and revegetated, but it just goes back to the fact that there is this opportunity for a win win win. You know, we these farmers and the farming community get to keep the best farms in production forever, um, and then their their water quality benefits, their economic benefits. There's really that they're. they're there are very few losers in this, if any. I mean, I think the only losers would be real estate developers who would want to um, put up houses through here. And you know, before I came to Palmer, I was in the real estate business for for nearly 15 years, and I would hear people talk about win-win solutions, and I always thought that was not true that there was no such thing because in my old business it was a zero-sum game. But what I've learned through doing this work over the last three and a half years, and really four years if you include my time on the board, is that this really is a win-win solution. So we're, 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 it was a big uh, accomplishment for us to get that provision included in the final water court decree, which was issued uh, in very, very, very late um, December of 2019. And that lays the groundwork for us to start moving water between parcels on behalf of farmers. Um, and then as Sarah, um, Sarah was so eloquent in, in describing conservation easements, when all that is said and done, will lock, lock these properties in with conservation easements. So say we take water from this red piece, move it to the green piece. Once that, uh, that, that exchange has been done, then we put a conservation easement on it to make sure that that water will stay 
on the land in perpetuity. Because the last thing we want to do is spend a lot of time and money, get the exchange done, and then somebody sell it, you know, uh, 10 years from now. So the, the key to the success of this project, and it has been extremely successful from a lot of different um, angles, is that it is a community driven process. You know, when this project has been in the works now for about six years, and it started with a few small community meetings of farmers. And that Pueblo County farmers, you know, I have them here at the top of the list because without them and without their enthusiasm and their wisdom and their buy in and really their leadership, none of this would be happening. Um, it's 100%, they get, they get all the credit. And because they identified this, this problem that was looming out in the distance of a potential dry up, that could dry up some of the most productive farmland, they started conversations with Palmer, started conversations with the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union. We all came together, started trying to brainstorm ideas. And this was even before my time at Palmer. Um, the county commissioners have been unbelievably supportive. Uh, the county has actually contributed to the, to the project, um, significant amount of money. And the, the list goes on and on. I mean, I could fill up this whole slide with all the different partners, but Pueblo Water, if, if not for their cooperation, we would not have been able to get our provision included in the final change case. So they're a, a partner that is, um, you know, without their help, none of this would be happening. But I mean, we've, we've attracted money and attention from everybody from Harvard University to the Lincoln Institute. Um, we've got a, t a great team of consultants, Colorado State. We're moving into finding funding from, from uh, impact investment funds and private equity funds. And I say, and I have Palmer Land Conservancy down at the bottom because really, we're just a facilitator of this without the, the local, the leadership and the enthusiasm of local community, none of this would, would be anywhere. And so at the end of the day, what we've got is a, is a voluntary market-based water exchange framework work. If done properly, and, I, and I'm gonna link to some documents that we've created and reports that we've created, there's a way for farmers to actually make money doing these transactions by transferring water to more productive farms and then selling the, the ones where they take water off, they can actually make money doing it. So there's a value proposition, which is one of the reasons that it's attractive, you know, from an investment standpoint, we see that it's scalable. Um, you know, obviously it keeps the most productive land in, in production and it gives the local community a say in what is dried up. As you saw in that map, if it was just dried up as it is right now, the way those map, those parcels are, or the, the parcels that sold their water, it would be a real problem from a lot of re, from a lot of different angles. And so what this allows us to do is, is go in with a mindful approach. All right, dry up's gonna happen. Let's be as strategic as possible about which parcels we, we do dry up. Um, it allows us to conserve irrigated farmland and then re properly revegetate the farmland that is dried up. And that's just part of the, the legal agreement with it laid out in that, that uh, water court decree is that public water is responsible for properly revegetating. So if we can help in that process, uh, we will. It maintains agriculture as an economic driver of Pueblo County, which is very important. And then there are lessons learned from this project that can be applied to other regions of the West, which we're very excited about. And so kind of finishing up here, um, next steps. So, you know, so, so we got that, that decree. Um, we got that provision included in the decree. What are we doing now? What are the next steps? And so when that when that uh, provision was included, all of a sudden this project went from a theoretical idea, oh, wouldn't this be great if we could do this, to now we have the framework in place to actually do it. And, and so we're, we are now fully in the implementation phase, trying to prove the concept and make sure that, that we can prove the concept and then figure out a way to do it at scale. And so number one on my priority, you know, my colleague Dylan's, uh, who, who just opened our office in Pueblo, um, our number one priority right now is a pilot water exchange. We want to assist farmers with the transfer of water from less productive land to more productive land. And that, in the document, I'll, the report that I will uh, put in the, in the notes, there are three different kind of case studies, main ways we can go about doing that. Ideally, we would like to be working with a farmer who owns, you know, one of each. And then we're able to, um, to help them, help him facilitate. But we're also raising money to help us go out and buy farms on behalf of farmers to kind of act as a bridge. Because a lot of these farmers are not cash rich. And there is a, there's a challenge for them in uh, purchasing a farm and then doing, the, doing the, the exchange. And so if we could go in and purchase a farm on their behalf, do the exchange, and then sell them the farm, 
all the better. The last thing Palmer wants to do is be in the farming business. But if we uh, we're actually, you know, we, we've had some success raising money for a fund for us to acquire farms so that we can help farmers um, do that. And this, this here is this investing in water optimization. This is a report that was based on a convening we had in Pueblo with farmers and some of the, some of the greatest water mines in the country, really. Sarah was actually a participant, which we greatly appreciated. And this lays out some of the findings from that two-day convening down in Pueblo. And it lays out ways that we can scale this, this project. Um, obviously, we need to work out any kinks and fully understand all the cost of doing a, a water exchange. But once that's done, the only way to really do this, um, have a, a lasting impact, we feel is to do it at scale. And so I'll, I'll link to that. I think some of y'all may find that interesting. And then kind of the next big thing on our radar is the 1041 permitting process. And it's kind of technical, but basically here in Colorado, if, if a state or if an area is gonna do something that is of, of state interest. So that could be, for example, drying up a third of the, the farmland in one of the most productive regions of the, the country or like putting in a nuclear waste dump, something like that. The, it, this permitting process gives the local county or local, gives them the authority to determine if mitigation funds are needed, if it's even allowed. And so Pueblo County, we've done a lot of research on this and Pueblo County actually has some of the most progressive 10, uh, 1041 powers of any state in Colorado. And so it lays out that if, if any sort of water supply project causes a loss in agricultural productivity or impacts on the local economy or degrades a uh, future sector of the local economy, that they, they need to be looked at very strictly through this 1041 process and possibly be willing to pay mitigation dollars. And so with the fund funding from the Colorado Water Conservation Board, who Sarah mentioned in her, um, in her presentation, some private funders, the Gates Family Foundation, the Rawlings Foundation, which is a, a local foundation in Pueblo, we raised a lot of money and, and commissioned a economic impact assessment of what, of, of that, that lays out not only how do we, it, the first thing is it lays out the, the cost of drying up that farmland. If that farmland were dried up tomorrow, what would that cost the county? And the short answer is between eight and $17 million a year in revenue every year. Um, if they, and then it, knowing that farmland will be dried up, this, this, um, this uh, report that we had written, it, it lays out ways to mitigate that, that loss. And so it's a very, it was very expensive and it's a very um, powerful document. And what we were told by county commissioners um, throughout this process is that you can't come to us in this 1041 process with a lot of um, emotion or, or passion about the importance of farming. We need hard numbers. We need quantitative data. And so that's the purpose of this, this uh, report. It's about 75 pages all told is that it quantifies this is exactly what's going to happen to the local economy if you start drying things up as they are. But if we do these particular things, and if maybe some mitigation dollars are put into the pot to be invested on behalf of the community, not only can we mitigate the, the, the um, impact of this, but we could possibly even have ways to improve the economic output. Um, so it's very, very exciting from a lot of uh, perspective. We just finished this, this recently. Um, and so, you know, as far as lessons learned, you know, how, how you people that are watching this, like, so what, 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 what is it, what does this mean for me? Um, and I'm happy to talk with any of you offline, feel free to email me, it's just ed at palmerland.org. I'd love to, to talk about this in detail, but the lessons I've learned and my, and my team here at Palmer have learned is that community focus is the most important part of this whole thing. Without a buy-in of the local community and leadership of the local community, and guidance from the local community, none of this is going to work. We could have the fanciest economic impact report and all this legal stuff, the greatest lawyers, all that. None of that matters without the community being completely trusting of us and, and giving us advice and helping us move this forward. And that's what I told Dylan, who I believe is on this call, nothing matters without that. And then that buys into relationships, obviously relationships with the local community, but relationships with all of our consultants. You know, Palmer, we, we um, relative to a lot of big, powerful land conservation groups, we're relatively small. We have 12 full-time staff, 
So a lot of this project is in based on leveraging the expertise of consultants, um, very smart water attorneys, and so and and our funders, obviously. Um, one one lesson that I've learned is that we really you have to be future focused on all things uh, legal and regulatory. Without uh, you know you think if we had missed the window to get that provision put in that water court change case, if we had if the the local community had not seen that threat coming, and we had not been set up with a lot of funding and a lot of smart lawyers, we would have missed that window, and that that decree would have been issued, and there would be no substitution of dry up provision. It would be it would be locked in. And that's how it would be. And those those very productive parcels would be dried up. So, um, and then with the 1041 process, we have no idea when that's gonna start, but we spent 18 months doing an economic impact analysis. So we're ready when it is. And so you have to be have to be forward focused. And that goes back to relationships, getting the inside info from from people who who are in the know about what these threats are and, and leveraging experts. Um, replica, replicability and scalability. Um, that's been one of the keys to our fundraising success. Obviously, people are interested in seeing Pueblo County succeed, but I think what really gets funders exciting is when these lessons learned can be applied to other regions of the West. And then from a kind of from a marketing standpoint, really being able to tell this story in a way that is exciting and engaging is key. Um, I've learned the hard way talking about water rights to people, particularly funders who may not know a lot about it. There's a point where their eyes just start glazing over. And it can be unbelievably boring, even for somebody like me who does this all day. And so figuring out a way to tell these stories in a way that's engaging, we're actually working on a feature length, or not a feature length, a 30 to 40 minute documentary about this project and about the local community um, that we're gonna be submitting to film festivals as a way to expand people's understanding of, the, of this issue. Um, and then there's everything from, from kind of targeting what we're talking about with some funders they're very focused on the market-based side of things how does this work with market-based and some are focused on the the grassland restoration it, it all depends but being able to tell the story in a compelling way is i think is is very very key and so there's just a few pictures from the area they were taken by russ schnitzer who was formerly at the gates family foundation just recently left but agriculture is everything in this region and without it I mean, it, the, the whole economy and the whole culture of the region is, is based on agriculture. And so um, yeah, I feel like it's a real honor to be able to do this work and, and work with the local community to figure out productive ways to, to keep agriculture an important part of this community in ways that it, literally everybody can learn. So I will be quiet and uh, look forward to any questions for me or for Sarah. I'll put that stuff in the links to Um, Ed, you made me blush with all your compliments. So I have to tell everybody that um, speaking of excellent storytelling, Ed is truly a master storyteller. And if you are looking for a new engaging podcast, I really encourage you to check out Ed's podcast because um, he is a, as good at crafting interesting questions for his guests as he is telling his own stories. So Shameless plug um, for Ed, who is awesome. Thank you, but Ed, the podcast is like the uh, is like this project. It wouldn't be anything without. I mean, I, I don't do anything. I just ask questions and, <laughs> and sense a theme from Ed here. Humble. <laughs> I saw a couple of questions come through, um, and Cindy. Uh, said, I'm hearing water, but my mind is asking what constraints or issues, potable water, algae bloom, toxic, contaminated, or heavy metal, are those factors looked at or at-risk habitats? Do these come into play? Cindy, I'm assuming this is for Ed, um, but tell me if I'm wrong. I'll just give that a, a shot. And for us, the I think the water quality piece is going to really come into focus um, in the future. Right now, we've been so focused on just kind of all, you know almost the the real estate transaction legal side of things to getting one of these pilot exchanges done so that we can prove the concept. 
And then, you know, the reality is when, when you're thinking about the, the revegetation, I always get a lot of questions about the revegetation. And I've actually had some great conversations with different groups, one out of California, that that's, that's what they do is revegetate grasslands. But one thing to keep in mind is that when those, when the, the, the own water moves to one piece and the least, the, the least water will move back to the other piece. And so that lease, you know, some, most of these leases now are going through 2039. So there's not gonna be any dry up as long as those leases are in place. And if Pueblo Water doesn't need the water and they keep extending those leases, it could, it could be a long time, but eventually when they come to take the water and they take it off, that's when the dry up is gonna need to happen. And that's when there's gonna need to be a lot of work put into understanding exactly, you know, as we go about revegetation and how that's gonna affect water quality. And there's a lot of interest in it. And in some ways I wish we could just go ahead and, and start drying and they could, they could dry up a parcel or two so we could, we could work on the, the revegetation part because I think there's, there's so much interest in it. Um, and there's, there's a lot of ways to really measure it and quantify what it's doing. But uh, again, until that 1041 process comes through, there ain't gonna be, there ain't gonna be any dry up. And so that's, I, I think everybody is very focused on that and very interested in that, but we're just not at the point yet where we are actively working on that. But I'm, I'm excited for the time when we do, because there's so many smart people that, that will help us figure out ways to move forward with that. I hope that answers your question. I think that was a good segue because the next question is about drying up and revegetating. Um, and I can speak a little bit to that. Um, and as I've mentioned, we haven't done any of these projects yet, but as we're exploring these with landowners in the San Luis Valley, um, it's been interesting because the whole, I thought that what we would mostly see was people wanting to um, reduce their, their groundwater pumping to some degree. Um, but keep irrigating. So, you know, to use a super simplistic example, you know, somebody has three circles and they, they say, I can reduce by 33% by rotationally following one of those um, each year. Um, and we have seen some of that kind of interest from people, um, but the couple of more pressing opportunities that we're exploring are actually for full dry up um, in parts of the valley where there isn't the CREP program. And um, the federal CREP program comes with some pretty tight restrictions. You have to um, ensure revegetation within three years with a total of 18 inches of water. And um, that doesn't work great um, from, from the, the properties that have been dried up. Um, and so we're looking at more flexibility um, to ensure successful revegetation. Um, we're also looking at, uh, through this uh, Regional Conservation Partnership Program funding, um, one of the interesting things about that program is that it's essentially a way to kind of couple different existing NRCS funding programs. So in this case, we're coupling their Agricultural Conservation Easement Program with their EQIP program, um, which provides funding for different practices and on the ground projects. And so we would be looking at, you know, how do we use EQIP funding at the same time um, for, for reseeding, but also, you know, we're, we're working with, there's an active soil health group in the San Luis Valley that has a really cool static compost pile. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, how can we use that local compost um, as we're working on revegetation um, and, you know, and what's the measure of success going to be for revegetation? Is it going to be um, just getting something on the ground to, to cover it? Or is it going to be, uh, you know, native species or diversity of species? And to be honest, it's probably going to depend um, on the circles themselves. We'll probably have more robust goals. And on the corners that are going to be harder to get water to, um, it'll probably be a, any ground cover is better than no ground cover kind of bar. Um, but we do anticipate those um, going back into agricultural production at some point um, after the dry up. So not a lot of producers want to take on that dry up themselves, which is why we're kind of looking to the water district as an intermediary owner 
um, during that revegetation process and, and being able to use them as an owner to maybe create some opportunities for research um, with, uh, with, it, one, with our land grant university to look at you know, different methods of revegetation and seed mixes. Um, but ultimately, um, to West's question, we are looking at those um, going back into some sort of grazing, ideally, um, a regenerative grazing practice. Yeah, on our on our end again, as I mentioned earlier, it's um, the the actual dry up is is likely going to be years from now, and so it's it's going to be interesting to figure that out. One one challenge I think um, in my mind at least is that a lot of these farms that we're dealing with are relatively small. You may remember I said the whole region is of uh, the that is irrigated by the Bessemer is about twenty thousand acres and. You know, just the other day, I was out on a ranch that was twenty-five thousand acres, and so it's um, a lot of these these farms are anywhere from eighty acres to maybe at the biggest two hundred fifty contiguous acres. And so, when you think about revegetating them and what the viability of that is for grazing or, or livestock of some kind, it's it's a lot different than when you're talking about big ranches. And so, I really think there's. I think we very well may be in a in a completely different world by the time we have to figure this out, and hopefully there'll be some some new benefits. I think a, a lot of what we're what we do is driven either you know by our ability to tell stories, or you know and and work our project into what funders are looking for. And I know that you know we get a lot, and this you know this audience understands it better than anybody from folks that are interested in regenerative land practices. And so personally, not not speaking for Palmer, but speaking for myself, if we could, I would love to see that worked in. But it's just hard to know. You think how much the world has changed in the last five years? What will it be like fifteen years from now? Um, but I think bottom line is there's going to be great opportunities, and there's and and there's going to be funding to to make it happen, but um, we will see. Um, there was a question about, you know, how many people are seriously willing to participate. Um, and Michael, I think I was the one who gave the example of the farmer with no kids that was in the San Luis Valley. Um, but I'll say, you know, the, the other thing that we have been looking at, one of the other big um, opportunities that we're exploring is a farm on the northern part of the San Luis Valley and it's kind of you know it's it's um, it's ecologically really important um, you know anecdotally and according to this water model if we took that farm out of production in terms of pumping um, wetlands would benefit on associated BLM lands um, you'd get uh, in-stream flow um, in a creek that hasn't doesn't normally see it, um, you know, after July, uh, there'd be a lot of ecological benefit. But really importantly, um, and this is you know what what Ed spoke to in terms of community, I think, is that this farmer is from out of state, and this farm has sort of been a thorn in the side of the community for a long time. And so, not only is it can we look at properties that are, you know, important for environmental reasons, or, or you know, we can look at those priority maps that um, that Palmer put together, which are so important for decision making. But it's those social and political elements I think that make things work. And in this case, the idea of um, being able to find the money to take a, a non-local farm out of production. Um, is really attractive for the community. And, um, you know, I, I presented to the Water District Board the other day about another opportunity where a real estate investment trust had purchased a farm um, in Subdistrict One, which has kind of the most critical timeline. And, you know, and this is a real estate investment trust that looks at farms all over the country you know, and, and essentially it's a group of investors that, that buys this farm looking for returns. And I said, you know, you and the community have the opportunity to be the offset, you know, to this. You can think about using your collective purchasing power um, to retire this farm. 
And so, you know, I think, I think it's important that we that we look at what assets are in a community, what um, partnerships can be brought into a community to help support, facilitate, bring investment. Um, but as Ed said, you know, ultimately it is up to folks in the community. Um, but finding those um, farmers who aren't necessarily living in the community, who just want to get out, um, I think can be an important key to that. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. I'll add to that. Um, one thing I've realized, you know, in my previous real estate work, I mostly work with ranchers. And so I've, I've you know, over the last four years, I've been getting really up to speed on farmers. And one of the things um, that I think is is clear for both farmers and ranchers is they're entrepreneurs. You know, they, they are balanced, the amount of different things they're balancing, whether it's the finances of the business to the logistics of the business to you know, we'll be down visiting with, with one of our, our great partners down there, and he's on the phone negotiating contracts with Whole Foods or with King Supers or whoever. And then he's dealing with a tractor that's broken down, or he's dealing with the, the paperwork um, that's required for, um, you know, farm workers from, from other countries that are coming in. I mean, it's just, it is unbelievable the number of balls that they keep in the air. And, you know, in my old work of selling big ranches, sometimes to extremely wealthy people, there was a, a there was this um, a lot of the conservation uh, focus that came from was driven by you know they wanted tax credits or they wanted to feel good about themselves or something like that. Whereas a lot of these farmers they don't they don't first of all they don't need tax credits from conservation easements, and then it's a tough business and these things have to make financial sense. And while they obviously love the land. And they, you know, when you think about uh, Wallace Stigner talking about boomers and stickers, like they are stickers. They love this land. They're not in it to become Jeff Bezos and fly around in rocket ships. Like they're in it because they want to make a lot of, they, they, they want, they have this commitment to the land and to their family. And so if we can come to them with a solution that makes sense from a financial perspective, that's what it all comes down to. They just can't, they're, they're not philanthropists. They're not making decisions based on giving things away or feeling good, if they can make business decisions that make sense that also make them feel good, um, that's where that's where this can be scaled. And so that's where a lot of the, the value proposition with these water exchanges comes in. It has to make sense from a financial perspective. And, you know, we've over the years worked with a lot of farmers down there where we're able to just, you know, just purchase conservation easements from them, bring in cash and buy an easement. And then that cash allows them to pay down debt or expand their operations. And we're, we're hoping that the same system is going to work out um, for the water exchanges, at least initially in the pilot stage. But in the end, for it to scale, it's kind of it's got to be self-sustaining. And it sounds kind of cold, like it's all about the money, but it is. And it's up to us to figure out a way, at least in this particular instance, it is. And, and it's up to us to find the way where we can have the conservation benefits and also give farmers the financial benefit. And so it's a, it's a great challenge um, and we're slowly but surely making progress. Can I ask you guys a question directly? <laughs> um, uh, I suppose, Ed, this is a little more directed to you, but Sarah, I'm guessing that there are circumstances where this applies as well. Um, uh, you know, I think that at the heart of many of the things that you're working on are an effort to um, not only sort of figure out water for agriculture in these areas that are um, sort of key food producing regions, but also sort of thinking about what is the larger water use strategy for in your case, Colorado, um, sort of how aware, <laughs> in your uh, opinion, are um, urban decision makers or urban residents about um, what's happening in these rural places? Um, and are there efforts to sort of help folks not only feel sort of connected to their regional food system, but potentially feel more connected to their regional watershed um, in a way that sort of connects all these dots? I go real quick, and um, I think if there's been a, a silver lining of COVID, it was that it 
made people understand that people that normally had not understood it. And, you know, when COVID uh, became a real issue, you know, in March, 2020, here at Palmer, we, we had plans to open an office in Pueblo and we had some expansion plans and we pretty quickly put those on hold just trying to see what was gonna happen. But then we, we uh, there were some different funding opportunities that came about because of, of, uh, of COVID and like Great Outdoors Colorado here in, in, in Colorado that basically reinvest lottery proceeds into conservation. They had a, a funding round for um, COVID related uh, conservation and we made the case that open space, which is what we do mostly up here in the Springs, and then food production is is very, very important. And uh, and we were able to get enough funding to open our new, to, to hire a full-time staff member, Dylan O'Hare, who has opened our office in Pueblo. And so, um, you know, given everybody's attention spans and the, the deluge of information that comes into these silly phones we have, you know, who knows how long people will, will remember that. But, um, I think that that helped people understand the importance of food and made people kind of think for a minute more than they had in the past about where their food comes from. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think it, that's been important. And I think that's, yeah, that's kind of all I have. Sarah, you have anything? Yeah, I was just gonna put a link in the, in the chat to an organization, um, searching my emails really quickly, trying to, trying to find out. we. A colleague and I gave a presentation to the Colorado Municipal League earlier this year in May. And um, I think here the challenge is that, you know, you have the major municipalities like Denver who are, you know, huge machines, um, very well resourced, very knowledgeable. And then you have, you know, these growing communities that pop up and, you know, they are being essentially staffed by an engineer or a water attorney that they have part time and they don't have the resources to kind of uh, be creative or, you know, or think about how they get their water, how they communicate to their citizens. And so, you know, I think that in my mind, our part of what I hope to accomplish as a land trust is to um, help provide the capacity for creativity to some of those water departments, um, you know, because they are staffed by folks whose job is exclusively focused really on managing risk, um, not necessarily thinking about the outside of the box, not necessarily thinking beyond their municipal boundaries. And so I think we have the opportunity to, you know, to show them different things that can be done. Um, and there's this group called the Water Now Alliance, which um, did develop a guide for municipalities. And I didn't get a chance to look specifically for that page, but, um, but I do think there's, um, there's increasing opportunity. And, and you know, as Ed talked about for farmers um, and money uh, often being kind of a bottom line issue, I think the same is true for cities. Um, you know, if you can show them that they can achieve some of their goals, not maybe not all of them, but some of them like drought recovery, water supply by, um, by leasing and they can get that more cheaply than if they have to buy a farm, um, you know, that's gonna be highly motivating for them. Um, and I will just say, I had a colleague, I have a, a friend, I participated in a water leadership course in Colorado years ago and, and a fellow alum of that program has talked to me about trying to develop um, like a water sourcing app that as a citizen, you could actually figure out where your city gets its water supply from, where it, where it came from, which I think is just really cool. I have no idea how one would do it, but I love the concept of really connecting, um, you know, connecting the dots for the people who care. And I, I do like to think and hope that there are increasingly a number of people who care. Um, I got to give a presentation to my son's second grade class last week about water and they all got it. And, um, and I sure walked out of there with a lot more hope for the future than I walked in with. So, um, so yeah, thanks. And one more, I'll just add one more thing to that, that the economic impact analysis that, uh, that I mentioned linked to, you know, the whole point of that is 
education. And, you know, it's when that, when that uh, language is written for the 1041 process, there is basically no, um, there's no institutional knowledge. There's nobody there when that, that was there when those guidelines were written that work there now. And so we see ourselves as not trying to push anything on anybody, but just saying, hey, just so you know, you've got the most progressive laws, the most progressive 1041 process in the state. You've got this great opportunity to set a precedent for other regions of Colorado. And I think that is, um, you know, I think that's a, a really good opportunity. I think that's that's one of the ways that we try to come at everything we're doing is, hey, we're here to serve. We're here to, to help. However, you know, what Sarah mentioned about increasing capacity. We know whether you're a farmer or a county commissioner, we know you're very busy and however we can help, we, that's, you just let us know. And because it's the note that Sarah ended on, um, and maybe you guys can both answer this as sort of our final question, a uh, final thought, sort of doing this work, because it is pretty scary in a lot of um, uh, ways. Uh, what makes you hopeful? For me, it's um, how many unbelievably smart people are working extremely hard on these issues. And I, it's something, if people listen to podcasts, they probably heard me complaining about it. I feel like a lot of the the media, even wet, you know, media focused on the American West is so focused on everything that's bad and everything that's bad. And there's plenty of bad stuff happening, but all day long, I'm with people that all they're doing is trying to figure out solutions and they are figuring out solutions and they're just as smart, just as, as aggressive as the, the, maybe the people that are not doing great things. And uh, I mean, I think the only, the only thing where there may be an imbalance is, is the funding, but, but we're working on that. And I'm, I'm a pessimist by nature. I wish I wasn't, but I am. And I'm extremely hopeful about everything because everybody on this call is the same way. They're extremely smart and they've decided to focus their attention. They could be in New York working at Goldman Sachs, but no, they're doing work that matters. And I think that's unbelievably, uh, that gives me an unbelievable amount of hope. Yeah, I, I think... Ed hit the nail on the head right there. Um, you know, I, I think that there's something really, you know, resilient about people um, in communities in the West and, and rural communities. And, um, you know, I, I had a colleague say to me like, boy, you know, I feel like I've been looking at to, um, you know, to the water leaders that, um, you know, that I saw when I got into this business and suddenly I'm realizing like, it's me. I, I'm, I am part of the solution. I don't get to look around to somebody else. And, um, and that's a really scary realization, but I think once you get past the fear, um, it just does, it leaves hope. Um, and, you know, I do think that there are so many people, um, you know, and we all have a role to play as part of this. Um, and it, and it can be overwhelming if we let it, but, um, but I think that we all have information to share ideas to share. Um, and the more, the less, the, the less we compartmentalize and the more we look to, um, you know, how we can integrate all of these things and look to other sectors for ideas and solutions, um, you know, we're, we're gonna get there. Ed and Sarah, thank you both so, so much for a really interesting uh, and informative uh, presentation this afternoon.